Let me attempt a little segue here. Not, not the best one ever, but we're talking about AI-powered drones. And I wanted to bring us to our next topic, which is to talk about robotics. Uh, that's been a recurring topic on this show lately, and that's because it really does feel like 2025 is the year that robots go from science fiction. Uh, and, and, you know, when I talk about robots, I'm talking about fully mobile humanoid style robots as opposed to factory robots or robot vacuum cleaners or, or whatnot. Um, and there have been a couple of announcements in the past week that I think really speak to that. Uh, so about a week ago, Google announced something called Gemini Robotics, and that is their foundation model and I think a bit of infrastructure as well, uh, designed specifically for robotics. So we have a big player now who is who is actually leaning into the software side of robotics. And you know, Chris, you and I have been talking about the fact that the software and the hardware seem to be reaching maturity at at a similar time. And so that's why we really have this moment in history. And then I saw just today, uh, NVIDIA is making a bunch of announcements at a conference and they have debuted something called Groot N1, Groot is a strange name, which they're calling a foundational model for humanoid robotics, right? So again, uh, NVIDIA interestingly have been getting into the, the foundation model game for the last six to 12 months. And this is not the only foundational model that they announced, but I think it's really interesting that it is tuned for robotics. And, and one of the interesting things is that the architecture of the model has these two thought modes, a sort of a rapid response fast mode and a more thoughtful, logical slow mode. And for those who are fans of uh, the, the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, I believe that was Daniel Kahneman. And you know, this idea that the human mind works in this way, that it has a sort of very fast pattern matching uh, side of things that allows us to be quick and to preserve energy and cognitive effort. And then we have this slow mode uh, where we think things through and we're more logical uh, and more methodical. And I think it's fascinating that as we're building out models for robotics, uh, it's actually drawing inspiration from the way that humans think. Uh, but I think it's just a really, really interesting time to be alive. Yeah, so, so Groot is not new. Groot's been around for a little while, but I think they've announced some new uh, versions and new iterations on that. And so when I talk about being super bullish on NVIDIA, um, you know, Groot is definitely part of the story for me. Um, and they, they've, you know, they roll out these whatever 15 robots on stage. And there's a lot of people that are in, investing in using Groot, using NVIDIA tech. The one that I followed more closely was the Google robotics announcement. And here's some takeaways uh, for people who haven't seen that. They've focused on three key tenants, that it has to be interactive, which means that if you ask it to put some strawberries in a container and you start moving the container around, the robot needs to be able to recalculate quickly and, and kind of follow the container and figure out the changing circumstances. Um, it needs to be dexterous. They had these two little pincer hands that were able to fold origami. That was incredible. Uh, and that it needs to be generalized to any task, basically, from you know sorting uh, strawberries to folding laundry to picking up the kids. And they said that it needs to do that across multiple physical forms. So anything from two little pincer hands to full you know, a bipedal robot to rolling robots to what have you. And they're, you know, claiming at least that, that that's their goal and that they've built a vision language action model. They call it vision language action model to do all three things across multiple physical forms. For me, this, this says two or three things. Yes, the time of robotics is here. Yes, NVIDIA and Google are going to be huge players in this. Um, I think this further demonstrates that Tesla is a joke at this point. Uh, Optimus is like more than a little more than a tech demo. I think they're way behind. Um, let's see if they prove me wrong. Um, and for me, you know, I just I don't know how you look at these and these things. And this is not financial advice, but I just don't know how you don't dump most of your money in the Magnificent Seven. I think you know between Google and Amazon and whatever, um, they're just going to, and NVIDIA, they're just going to consume all intellectual and physical labor. <laughs> and so uh, I think it's just, it's huge. This is just such a, this, the size of this business will, will can dwarf entire economies. Uh, and I think it's just very, very exciting. And so um, I, I can't wait, I can't wait to see what comes from this. It is super exciting. I mean, I think it does seem like it's, seems like it's this perfect moment of aligning all these things that we've actually been all these these disparate tracks that you've seen sort of progressing for so long, like you know the dexterous thing. I mean, we've we've seen in medical innovation, we've seen surgeons being able to use 
these types of tools for remote surgery for some time at like incredible precision and with incredible um, clarity and uh, execution um, at that. So we know that that has existed. And then now with this sort of alignment of um, AI models being able to process unstructured data and consume the world around. And, um, you know, you see these things sort of coming together in a way that really makes sense. Um, that's going to be uh, pretty, it could be pretty world changing. I think in the in the past, we've talked about different modalities and sort of wearable devices and sort of what that interface looks like when the products that we have in our everyday lives are consuming the world around us and then becoming supportive assistance to us, you know, agents and assistance to us uh, in our everyday lives. And I think we're just really seeing the foundational building blocks for what that's going to be um, pretty soon, which is, I I think, very, very exciting. Um, I do think it's a little bit ironic that it's the same week that we also, I don't know if you guys saw the news that iRobot announced that it was probably going to uh, going to go bankrupt. So oh, there really? was also that news that our Roombas, yes, that the Roombas might be be bricked. So there's, um, you know, it is kind of interesting that, that one of the very first home robots that we ever saw come into really into, I would say, like, you know, pretty widespread adoption. I think it was one of the very first. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's there's not not confirmed yet, but uh, they did. They did make that announcement earlier this week. I didn't catch that announcement. I'm I'm actually kind of blown away by that. Um, and, and as as robotics, uh, consumer robotics is about to take off for iRobot to be failing is I think that's just that that is massive mismanagement combined with um, huge competitive forces from China, right? The Robo Rocks and the and the Oppos or whatever the the coming out of China is. Like, there's a whole suite of these things that are smarter, faster, better, cheaper, more innovative. Um, yeah, I actually, I've been buying iRobot Roombas for, I don't know how long, 15 years. One of the first ones Same. I bought, which just bounced around my apartment doing nothing and e eating cables. Same. Um, and the latest one that I purchased, I ended up buying a Roborock, uh, because I was like, oh, this one is like a Same. really big. Yeah. And I think that's just. Same journey. Same Roborock. They didn't keep up. Speaking of, um, Chinese espionage and, um, soft power. <laughs> Yes. It's funny to think that we have a little LiDAR-enabled device mapping the insides of our homes and probably sending all of that information back to some servers in China. And you know what? I am there for it because it is incredibly convenient. Well, I mean, just, let's take a little side journey here to take that, that point very seriously. You know, while we talk about LLMs and we talk about TikTok, because it seems like the US government is, is fucking stupid, um, we're not talking about DJI drones and rubber rocks and, you know, network infrastructure that is indexing, you know, the digital world, the interior, interior world and the exterior world for China all the time. I mean, it's just, it's just the kind of the lack of complete, you know, complete awareness of the battlefield is, is, is a bit laughable. I think it is pretty interesting, I, you know, just to go on a personal journey with this, you know, like you, Chris, I was one of the first like really brought on iRobot you know, Roomba, like, yeah, probably a decade ago, um, survived through multiple iterations of it, finally made the leap to the I, uh, to the Robo Rock last year. Love it. And kind of interestingly, um, also, we've also traded in our Tesla for a BYD Shark. Uh, so, you know, it is it is pretty compelling to see this incredible Chinese tech that's just coming up to the quality um, I mean, the, the quality of the tech has always been there, but I think from, you know, I, speak, I say this as a consumer, sort of as a, as a designer um, by trade and as kind of a consumer investor as well, um, you know, it hasn't, Chinese tech hasn't in the past met the consumer expectations of the Western market, and they understand that, and now they are in a lot of different products, and they're building vehicles that feel luxury, electric vehicles that feel luxury, um, and they are growing at a pace and a scale that it is absolutely wild. Um, and it is, and you know, as a consumer, we said, "Hey, well, actually, the BYD Shark is pretty great. We can't get uh, a Rivian here in Australia, although I would have loved to get a Rivian, to be honest." Um, but we, you know, that was the decision that we made. That was like, this is a fabulous vehicle, and I think you know, this is. I think it's a pretty interesting time to see consumer adoption moving so strongly, but. 
Yeah, I just while we were sitting here, I, I did look up Amazon's bid for I for uh, iRobot fell through in January. They made their SEC filing on Wednesday uh, this week and reported a 44 percent drop in revenue and issued a warning that, you know, they could be out of business within 12 months. So, yeah, iRobot, it's like they're the AOL of robot vacuum cleaners. They haven't kept up. But yeah, actually, just a very quick side note to our side note. You mentioned BYD versus Tesla. Right. Um, I know we have a bunch of listeners in the US where BYD doesn't really trade um, because of tariffs. Uh, and so it's a fascinating thing for those outside of the US. There is really no reason to buy a Tesla, even if you don't have a problem with Elon Musk. Like the whole Elon Musk thing has definitely been weighing on Tesla sales. But the truth is, you get into a BYD, it is the same level of good, often better for half the price. And people just vote with their wallets. It's the same way that, you know, every other bit of consumer electronics is now made in China because it's cheaper and better, right? You don't think, oh, I want to get a TV that's made in the USA or made in Japan. They're all made in China. Well, electric cars transition to EVs have transitioned them into electronic appliances. And that is where China shines. So BYDs are really pretty incredible at, at every price point at which they operate. And, you know, it is not just Chinese tech. I mean, like there's just, I think we're at the point now where the competitive in terms of EVs, um, you know, the Kia EV6, the Kia EV9 um, and EV5, those cars, you know, they've caught up. I think we're looking at the Polestar, um, you know, the Polestar 4 that's just been released. That's a pretty incredible um, EV competitor. And so I think there's obviously sort of a perfect storm when it, when it comes to Tesla of uh, a, a particular reaction to Elon Musk. Sure, but also viable competitors in viable price points across the market that are being made available elsewhere. Yeah, R Rivian's are very popular in uh, Silicon Valley now. There's a lot of Rivians around, especially given how small they are and, and boutique they are. They're, they're, there's a lot. Um, you know, I went to China, I want to say seven, eight, nine years ago before the Hong Kong riots. It's difficult to explain how many people with how much enthusiasm and momentum and seriousness of purpose there are in China. Um, there's, you know, there's more billionaires in China than whatever people in the U S or something. I don't know. And so it's, you know, that here first. No, I think that's actually true. There's some stat. Well, there's 300 million billionaires in China. <laughs> I don't know what the stat is, but there, you said there's more billionaires in China than people in the U S there it might be there more, more millionaires in China than people in the U S so there is actually some stat like that, which blows your mind. I don't remember what the stat is, but sheer force of will brute force, low, you know, labor, uh, labor costs, which, you know, uh, there's, there's plenty to say about that and the ethics of that, uh, and, and on and on. Yeah. It is a freight train. And then, as we said, you know, two topics ago, that's without the U S shooting itself in the face. One of my favorite, all my favorite nerdy TV shows from years back is Firefly. Um, and one of the, the characteristics of that fictional universe is that everybody can speak Chinese and English. Because the the backstory is that there was this China China Anglo merging, this big giant merging of cultures, uh, and that, that that seemed inevitable even whatever fifteen some years ago. Um, yeah, this is this is a I think that's that's the future. We're all going to be speaking English and Chinese or Mandarin. My kid is in a Mandarin immersion school for that reason, uh, and um, yeah, that's uh, the geopolitics are going to be completely different in, in a few years. Could be.